Welcome back to our study in the book of Acts. We're going to begin our fast, fast missionary journey, fast of three. And we're going to try and follow what's happening and where it goes. Uh, it covers quite a distance, 1,235 miles. And obviously this is not by aeroplane or by train or even. <clears throat> this would be a lot of it by foot, uh, a little bit perhaps by horse and some of it by sea. Took approximately two years. Here's an overall map. You can see a, a, a quite detailed. <coughs> Excuse me. So the first mystery journey, part one, Antioch and Syria to I Iconium and back. The Antioch, the Antioch congregation becomes the first base of operations for missionary outreach to the Roman world. Jesus had chosen Paul to be the main force in organizing missions to the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit sends out Barnabas and Saul, at this time it's called Saul, but later it's going to change to Paul, on this first missionary journey. John Mark accompanies them part of the way. Uh, there's a number of uh, booklets with, uh, this is out of one of the Bibles, uh, detailing the missionary work of the early church, the three missionary journeys and the voyage to Rome. Uh, this is out of the same Bible, the idea of Paul's tree uh, is basically the tree of his, his life. <clears throat> and the key is on the end with it. This is all to be found on the PowerPoint section uh, on my website. In many ways, chapter 13 verse 1 says, In the church of Antioch there were prophets, teachers, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the track, and Saul. In many ways the congregation of Antioch was a model congregation, the kind of example we should try to strive to emulate. <clears throat> we know in Acts 11, 27 to 30, the generosity towards the brethren in Judea. And as we continue reading, we discover a number of gifted leaders who are zealously and selflessly serving the Lord in this area. The congregation beginning in Jerusalem had been in existence for a while. Antioch has become the second most important congregation. Antioch has become really the center of Paul's journeys. <clears throat> What is the difference between a prophet and a teacher? A prophet is one who foretells the future or brings a message from God. Uh, Agabus was seen as this, was he was, was the church in need of prophets at the time? Obviously because there was a big famine coming up. And also we didn't have the New Testament, we didn't have the written New Testament. So therefore the people of God needed people who could prophet, foretell of the future, but also prophesy in telling forth the message of God that God had already revealed. Teachers are mentioned several times in the New Testament. Do we still need teachers today? I think we do. <clears throat> the first congregation in the Gentile world was truly multi-ethnic and diverse. Barnabas, a Levite, naturally from Cyprus, Cyprus, Cyprus sorry, a very prominent man among the disciples. <clears throat> Simon called the Niger. Niger is a Latin name meaning black. The title evidently had some allusion to his color. Nothing no, no, more is known about Simeon. Many want to connect this Simeon with Simon from Cyrene, who helped Jesus carry the cross. The Ethiopian eunuch was undoubtedly a black man who had converted to Judaism and then to Christianity. Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene was a city in Libya in northern Africa. Lucius is not to be confused with Luke. We don't know much about this man. Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod Antipas I at the Tetrarch, this was a Jewish man who had been connected to some, in some way to the house of Herod. Saul, naturally from Tarsus, Tarsus learned under Gamaliel's feet. He was a high, highly qualified, highly intelligent man. He was the number one persecutor of the congregations in Christ. He was going to Damascus when God changed his life completely and challenged him. Go to Damascus and then Ananias would tell him what he had to do. Barnabas introduced him to the apostles in Jerusalem. He needed to use some persuasion. Saul or Paul, Saul was his Hebrew name, Paul is his adopted Roman name. He ministered, he said to serve, as he ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them, to serve, to help, to work, to be able to offer some service, to minister. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time 
the same sacrifices which never can take away sins. But he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sin for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Fasting is primarily the act of willingly abstaining from some or all food, drink or both, for a period of time. It was often common in Jewish practice. What exactly did it mean to fast? Does help fasting help us now today? Luke doesn't define this fasting, neither does Luke say that the church has selected some days now as to practice this. Those who advocate for the use of fasting in their congregations today are missing the point. This was something very cultural to the Jewish people, and we're not commanded in the Bible to fast at all as Christians. Yet fasting can be good for you. We tend to eat too much as it is, and it's good to be able to every now and again clear the body and allow the mind to be sharpened by uh, focusing our attention. And especially when we come together to pray for something important in the church, it's good to spend some time uh, cleansing ourselves and fasting together. But it's not commanded. It's not uh, something that we can um, impose on other people. It's something you voluntarily uh, do as a congregation, perhaps, or as individuals within a congregation. Fasting was never commanded or pro prohibited by the Lord Jesus. Yes, in the Old and New Testament, we see the practice very openly. Many in the New Testament fasted. Paul was talking about this. These men in Antioch were fasting. Moses did. David did. Daniel did. Is fasting any benefit? Yes. Fasting has helped and continues to help some, but this practice has no value at all as a religious ceremony. We deceive ourselves and believe that we are more spiritual because we fast every month or a week or every two weeks, for example. <clears throat> Jesus is not commanding Christians to fast. We need to understand he came to fulfill the law and the prophets and he followed the law of Moses very closely. Fasting will not make us better or worse in front of God. Jesus in Matthew condemns the hypocrisy and he said if you fast to be seen by men, you already have your reward. Just as ice curling is from Scotland, fasting was unique as a, fairly unique as a Jewish practice. Fasting is not a commandment of the New Testament. We don't have, need to have Bible passages that specify some fasting as a commandment. The New Testament doesn't say who shall fast, when you shall fast, how often you are to fast, how long you shall fast. We're commanded to repent if there's any sin and to transform ourselves by being like Christ. These are far more important issues. The Holy Spirit, as the minister Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Holy Spirit, a member of the Godhood, as you can see in the Bible, Matthew 28, the, the tri, triunity, the Spirit of God speaks. This is a personal attribute that we have no doubt that he can command and order. The Jehovah's Witnesses says the Holy Spirit is just a fluid, a power, or some inanimate force like electricity. But the Holy Spirit is God, and we should never be afraid to say this. To set apart, to consecrate for some special reason, Verse 2 says they ministered to the Lord and fasted in the Holy Spirit. Now separate me, Barnabas and Saul. They were consecrated for a particular job or assignment. Who called Paul? Jesus or the Holy Spirit? If we can follow correctly the information in Acts 9, it was Jesus. What the Holy Spirit is saying is it doesn't matter who called, they're all the same God. Father, Son and Holy Spirit are working for the same purpose, the salvation of mankind. The Holy Spirit is making these two men his, his very own. I have something for them. I need Paul and Barnabas to do work I've called them for. To whom is the Holy Spirit talking to when he says, sit apart from me? He's talking to the congregation, the same entity that should exist today. The congregation in Antioch was not being governed from somewhere else. It is autonomous, and we can see for this from here, because there is no apostle from Jerusalem involved in this. Sometimes in our preaching and teaching of the book of Acts, we emphasize man's response to the gospel through faith, etc. That is good, but we need to remember that God's emphasis on the fact that Christ is king, the emphasis on the fact that his kingdom is coming to being, bringing redemption to man through the blood of Jesus. That's the good news that needs to be emphasized on the mission field. Philip simply went out to preach the gospel when he went to Samaria. No one sent him, no missionary society was behind him, no mission board gave him an official stamp of approval, he simply went out to Samaria and proclaimed the gospel because he saw a need. Our love for God and mankind should be our motive for reaching out to others with the gospel. Philip simply went out to preach the gospel when he went to Samaria. He saw the need, he knew Jesus would make a difference in people's lives. 
Maranatha, he is risen, a message of joy and salvation. Jesus still needs to proclaim, be proclaimed to all nations, probably more so now with the amount of people we have in the world. So we see the, let me go back to that in a sec, <coughs> see the first missionary journey in the distance it covers. Uh, in Acts 13, 1 to 4, he begins his missionary journey in Antioch. He and Barnabas eventually travel hundreds of miles uh, from Antioch to Derby, then back again. Having stated that there is no command for us to fast, there is an advantage in focusing the mind. We in Corby have fasted and prayed before, making big decisions in the past. We didn't force anyone to do it. Those who wanted to did it. We didn't make any big deal out of it. Prayer was connected with fasting in the past. They prayed as we ought to pray before being involved in any new venture, work, activity or mission. We should be asking for the approval and blessing and involvement of the Lord, <coughs> rejoicing always. Pray always. I've seen before the laying on of hands <coughs> was used to impart spiritual gifts of power. Then the two apostles, Peter and John, came to Samaria, Samaria and laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. They received something Simon could see. Simon saw that through the laying on the apostles' hands, <coughs> the Holy Spirit was given, that is, the ability to work miracles or an act of a miracle. Simon said, Give me this power also that anyone in whom I lay on my hands may receive a gift from the Holy Spirit, basically. <clears throat> we see this also in 2 Timothy 1 6. Apostle Paul imparted a gift to Timothy. Stir up the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. The eldership, the presbytery, was present. Neglect not the gift that is in you which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. <clears throat> it was by Paul's hands and with the hands of the eldership. The eldership were present and gave approval, but Paul's hands were the means by which the miraculous abilities were imparted. Paul's hands were means by which the abilities were parted, the eldership were present and gave approval, meaning they were involved in commissioning and supporting Timothy for the task ahead. In this case, in Acts 13, 2, 3, Barnabas and Saul are not receiving a gift of power from the elders. They are being commissioned, set apart by laying on of the hands, being recognised by the congregation. It's a solemn way of impressing upon the congregation the serious and important duties that were to be performed. So for this purpose, the support of the elders is being demonstrated in a very positive way. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. To send away is another way of saying, go with God. May the Lord protect you in all that you are about to say and do. We find this in our passages. Like all things, there is more involved than can be seen at first glance. Evangelism is a team effort. There are those who are willing to go but they cannot get very far without the help of others supplying for the physical and spiritual needs with money and prayers. There were those who worked behind the scenes in Jesus' ministry to enable him to do his work. It's some journey. And so they go from Antioch uh, down to Cilicia, also known as Cilicia Peria. Now it falls within the modern boundaries of Turkey near Syria. Some ruins, amazing builders. Seleucia was founded in 300 BC by Seleucid Fast Nicator to provide a seaport for Syria, Antioch. The city was located near the mouth of the river Orontes, where it falls into the Mediterranean. The distance from Antioch, Seleucia, by water was 41 miles, while overlaid, overland it was 16 miles. The river was not navigable by ocean going boats because of its many rapids. It was often called Cilicia by the sea, to distinguish from other times bearing the same name, and serves a naval base in Roman imperial times. From Cilicia then they go to Salamis. Note that the Holy Spirit leads Barnabas and Saul to the island of Cyprus, the home of Barnabas. This is why they call the first missionary journey. How long it last? Maybe one to two to one and a half years, maybe some as close to two. Paul and Barnabas have been sent by God, the Holy Spirit, for one of the most important journeys to the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit is a organization, organize, the Holy Spirit is organizing the trip. Paul and Barnabas and John Mark embarked from Cilicia to Cyprus. A scientific name for copper is Cuprium, related to the Greek word for Cyprus, Cupros. Cyprus was an abundant source of copper in ancient times. Cyprus is also known as the birthplace of Aphrodite in Greek mythology. The Hebrew name was Kittim, from which the Hebrews got their word for the islands, coastal countries and inhabitants around the Mediterranean Sea. 
Salamis was the largest city on the island, for it was the old Greek capital of the island. It was located in the southeast part of the island. A few hours of sailing in favourable weather would bring missionaries from the port of Seleucia to the port of Salamis, which was a splendid harbour in New Testament times. The people of Salamis needed the salvation offered in the Gospel, whether Jews or native Cypriots, who were mostly worshippers of Aphrodite, and whose worship included human sacrifice. According to Lanctactius, human sacrifices were offered there periodically until the time of Hadrian. <coughs> the preaching of the word would mean speaking about Jesus as with three, John 3.16, that God so loved the world. When they arrived in Salamis to preach the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, they also had John Mark as their assistant. Peter in Acts 2.36 says, God has raised him up. That's Peter 1.18, knowing you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile ways inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Jewish colony of Salamis must have been large, since mention is made of the synagogues, that's plural. There had to be at least ten families to, to begin a synagogue. If there are established, long established synagogues, it would be even bigger than that. Apparently they were in this city for some weeks, visiting a different synagogue every week or so. The apostles uniformly preached fast to the Jews before going to the Gentiles, for so God had ordered it. <clears throat> they also had John Mark. And is this the writer of the book of Mark? Is this the same man, son of Mary, where the church was gathered? The word translated helper is a word commonly rendered deacon or minister, and either of these words would give some suggestion as to what Mark's duties were. They meant to serve. He might have helped so that the apostles could be free for the preaching work of the evangelism. Perhaps Mark's task was to trade the converts after they had been won. Luke uses the same word in Luke 1 verse 2 of those who give eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus. And so from Salamis to Paphos. The length of the whole island was nearly 150 miles, but it would be only 100 miles from Salamis to Paphos. Did they evangelize as they went? Cunnivar and Housen think they did not, for if Paul followed his later custom, they say that he may have evangelized only the larger populated centers, allowing them to evangelize, them to evangelize the surrounding areas. On the other hand, Ramsey, another great historian, thinks the verb gone through is a technical term in Acts for going over a country as a missionary, preaching wherever they went. <coughs> Paphos was a city to the western end of the island and served as a Roman capital of the island. It had a small harbour which at times offered no shelter from the prevailing winds. There was a celebrated temple there in which Aphrodite, Venus, was worshipped. The worship was notorious for the licentiousness of the harder priestesses who served in the temple. They needed the gospel too. <coughs> Modern scholarship Gelded House, as recently as 1902, Wissaker believed that the historical value of Acts shrinks until it reaches a vanishing point. He thought it's a total waste of time as a historical book. And think about that, it's 1902. The two begin school, these books are without value except for the we section in Acts. This is a German higher school of, of criticism, uh, which we learned how to take the Bible apart, but we couldn't put it back together again. Gelded House, towards the end of the last century though, and during the first part of the present century, the researches of men like Ramsey, Harnack and Hawkins brought to light masses of surprising facts that confirm the historical accuracy of the statements in Luke, which were formally condemned as fictitious. <laughs> Once again, God's word comes through. Gallenhausen says, in consequence, a complete change will have been brought about in, in the historian's opinions regarding the historical trustworthiness of Luke. After doing research work for many years in regions described by Luke, Ramsey stated unambiguously, Luke's writing is unsurpassed in respect of its trustworthiness. Gandhausen says, summing up, he wrote, Luke is a historian of the fast rank. Not merely are his statements trustworthy, but he is possessed of a true historical sense. In short, this author should be ranked along with the very greatest of historians. These words are important coming as they do not from an apologist or a theologian, but from a recognised authority in archaeology. Professor Otto Piper 
Whenever modern scholarship has been able to check up on the accuracy of Luke, the judgment has been unanimous. He's one of the finest and ablest historians in the ancient world. The sorcerer and false prophet Bar Jesus, son of Joshua, was also called Ilamas, from the Arabic big word meaning wise man and magician. This is verse 13, verse 6. When they'd gone through the island of Paphos, they found a sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar Jesus. The Greek equivalent would be Magus, we've met them before. The wise men who visited Jesus' infancy were called by this name. Daniel had been one in Babylon. Do you see the resemblances to Simon the sorcerer of Samaria and Acts 9? Both were deceiving people. Attention should be called to the fact that neither in the Old Testament nor in the New Testament is a magician or a soothsayer approved. The Old Testament commanded all witches and wizards to be put to death, out of the land by death. That ought to suggest certainly to us that a Christian has no business whatever in patronising a spiritualistic medium, a fortune teller, or any stargazer, or person of that thought. Or even if you want, uh, I mean, anything to do with the uh, horoscopes that you see in regular newspapers. If anyone does, it seems that it reveals that he has lost faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his word, as he is all sufficient to govern and direct his life. So we Christians ought not to be tempted to sin by going to a fortune teller to have a fortune told. A Jewish false prophet, like many occultists in the 20th century, the servant of the devil pretended to be a prophet of God. Luke, and I'll tell you what, there's lots of people today, uh, and, and especially on the God channel, who are claimed to be prophets of God and they're also serving the devil in the same manner. Luke said his claims were false. Likewise would be the claims of magicians today if they claimed to be a prophet from God. Some Jewish people claimed in addition to the sacred books from Yahweh, some books having come down from Solomon had information about charms and spells and how to cast them. Perhaps about Jesus had some of these in his library. The Isle of Cyprus swung back and forth between the government by proconsul and government, uh, government by a governor. Strabo tells us the island was originally an imperial province but in 22 BC, it was transferred by Augustus to the Senate. Under Hadrian, it was all under a governor, and again under proconsul in Severus's time. <clears throat> For a long time, skeptics argued that it was a mistake in the Bible, where Luke called Sergius a proconsul. He should have called him a governor, they insisted. Now, coins and inscriptions from the time of Claudius have been found at Curium and Citium, in which the title of proconsul is given to the immediate successors of Sergius Paulus. Roman magistrate, former consul in charge of a province, like a proprietor, the, uh, the proconsul was someone who acted as if pro, he were an official magistrate. He could have all the powers of a consul, but he was in fact a former consul whose term in official uh, in office was prolonged, pro gratio. Here's an inscription found first century and a big rock. Still later it's only a coin with the inscription Paulus the Consul, Proconsul was found. Luke's veracity, his truthfulness is again affirmed. We should remember that statesmen and generals in that age were in the habit of consulting oracles and auguries about all important matters, remember Alexander the Great, and of keeping them with them, about them someone who is credited with interpreting the signs of approaching good or evil. Uh, even modern politicians are not immune. <clears throat> Ronald and, and Nancy Reagan were strong believers in psychic readings. His presidential term of eight years was filled with political scandals and assassination attempts. <sighs> it is believed that President Reagan survived all the scandals with the help of a psychic named Joan Quigley, whom Nancy Reagan used to consult on a daily basis. How I ran the White House. Very good. Many people today are also being misled by some psychics. Celebrity psychic Thomas uh, John Being, John being sued for non-payment of a PR firm who fixed his image after his Craigslist scam emerged. Two hundred million psychic scam targeted the elderly, leaving them broke and homeless. Two psychics in Times Square, New York, who were charging a thousand pound to move cusses cuss uh, were busted by a private investigator set up. Psychic who scammed love lawn man out of £550,000 released from jail. So when the two Jews came to Paphos claiming to bring fresh revelations from God of Israel, the same good sense prompted him to send for Barnabas and Saul. 
This man didn't believe that Paul and Barnabas were at the same level as his sorcerer. <clears throat> he wanted to hear what they had to say. The verb epizeto in the classic Greek means put questions to someone. Did Sergius Paulus ask a number of questions to the preachers in order to find out what the context of the message we're preaching was? What they said was the gospel. We all need to ask for the gospel of Christ. It's the only way to salvation. The central message of the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Elibus was opposing them. He resisted the message of God. Did he try some spell or hex or simply utter half-truths about the Christian message? The same word is used in 2 Timothy 3 verse 8 of magicians who withstood Moses. What they did may give some idea of what Elimus was doing in his attempt to influence Sergius Paulus to ignore the Christians. Whichever he did, he certainly was motivated by the knowledge that if the influence of Barnabas and Paul should be extended over the proconsul, he would be out of a job. Seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith, he was trying to keep Sergius Paulus from becoming a Christian. Faith here stands either for the Christian religion or the body of doctrine that Christians believe, which not only points in the right direction, it also points out the error of magic and witchcraft. Is it significant that after his encounter with Sergius Paulus, that from that moment on, <coughs> Saul is called <coughs> Saul is Paul, called Paul, Paulus in the Greek, <coughs> except for reference to his previous life. We don't know much about the reasons or the date of the change of name. Filled with the Holy Spirit, the participle is said to imply a sudden coming of a spiritual power just to be used for what will be done to Elimus. <clears throat> it is suggested these gifts of power were not permanently abiding things, but the apostles and spiritual gifted men received the powers as and when they were needed. Uh, I would say at this point that Elimus is in big trouble. Uh, verse 9 says, Saul, who was called Paul, filled with all the Spirit, looked intently at him. Paul is moving his focus from the con proconsul and begins to look at Elimus. Fixes his eyes on him. That means something is about to happen. But what is it? I don't think Elimus knew what was about to happen. Remember what happened to Herod? Deceit is rendered uh, verse 10. And he said, Oh, full of all deceit and fraud, you son of devil, you enemy of all right righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? The seed is rendered dolos, a, a word should mean bait, like that used to catch a fish or trap animals. They're full of deceit and fraud. The word suggests Elimus was using his magic to catch a trap that for a consul, and he knew that he was using this bait. Fraud represents the word, a word which literally means ease of working, doing something adroitly. He was clever, he was good at it. The action of the magician, levitation, telekinesis, etc., were done in a slick, cunning manner in order to trick and deceive the proconsul. Paul tells Elimus that he is under influence of the devil because he's promoting the devil's desires and purposes. He belongs to the devil because he's opposing the good news of the gospel. Elimus <clears throat> was perverting the way of the Lord by opposing what was being preached. Crooked ways denote the ways of a sinner, the deceiver, the imposter. The hand of the Lord is upon you. <clears throat> Eleven says, And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for time. And immediately a dark mist fell upon him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. The hand of the Lord is upon you. This expression has already been shown in the footnote at Acts 11.21 to be an expression indicating divine punishment. <clears throat> that apostle would inflict punishment through the power of God is apparent from Timothy and Acts 5. Remember, they carried out Ananias and Sapphira. You will be blind. By this sudden and miraculous punishment, Elimus, Elimus would be awed and humbled and perhaps encouraged to repent. Bystanders, such as proconsul, would be convinced that Elimus was an apostate and that the gospel was true. It confirmed the words of Peter and John, Peter and, and Barnabas. Enemy of all unrighteousness. Righteousness is a word regularly used in the Bible, God's way of saving a man, which when accepting accepted results in living right by the man walking in new life. <clears throat> Elimus's activities by the design and promoting of the devil <clears throat> are opposed to both a man's becoming saved and then living right. 
<clears throat> the right ways of the law, the straight paths or doctrines of the Christian religion of opposition to the crooked and perverse arts of deceivers and impostors. Straight paths denote integrity, sincerity and truth. <clears throat> How long did it take for LMS to become blind? Just minutes. The punishment was from God. It says immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. This was a real miracle, not a kind of fit miracle. Miracle. The people around need to see the great power from God, and they saw as they saw with Herod. His blindness will only be temporary, Paul says. You shall see the sun for a season. Perhaps for repentance is a hope. The word mist is one of the regular medical words used to describe a disease of the eye. Hippocrates, their father of medicine, used the word to denote an extinction of sight by the drying up of or a disturbance of the fluids in the eyeball. <clears throat> the change was so sudden that he knew not where to go. He saw one to guide him in the ways in which he had before familiar. The tense of the verb he was seeking seems to imply no one would offer him help. Poor old, poor old guy, really. Are religious faith fake healers, uh, fake healers and false prophets still perfecting the right ways of the Lord? We see them on TV every day and night of the week. I suspect the motives of many of these modern-day Elamuses are the same as Balaam's and all the rest. Money and power. They don't seem to be very short of either. Paul says if anyone listened to an angel who spoke a message different from the written gospel, that he would be accursed. And yet, night after night after night on our TV screens, on the God Channel, we hear men and women all the time making all sorts of claims that are in direct contradiction to the Word of God. <clears throat> Just recently, there was a, uh, an American uh, votes for a, for a particular uh, politician. Uh, and on the God Channel, many of the people in the God Channel were voting for uh, a particular person, uh, saying that they would win. And all of a sudden, when he lost, they had to backtrack. And it's amazing to see the, the fast shuffling feet of those as they try to cover up their false prophecies. <clears throat> We've got at least two religions begin through this false prophecy, fake, fake healers and false prophets. Islam and Mormonism both started off in similar ways. Miracles in the Bible are too credential to, to be make true or to confirm uh, the message. And as we indicated before, the same is true here. The blindness of Elamis opened the eyes of the proconsul. He believed what, it, what exactly is the word implying? Acts 8 verse 12 says, When they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, men and women alike. Acts 11 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them in a large number who believed, turned to the Lord. And so they move on <clears throat> up to Perga. At this point, John Mark leaves and returns home. John Paul and his party set sail from Paphos that came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John departed from him, returning to Jerusalem. Now Paul and his companions, that New American Standard says, put out to sea from Paphos. Put out to sea is a verb used here in its technical sense, meaning set sail. His companions speaks of Barnabas, John Mark, and perhaps some converts recently made during their missionary work in Cyprus. It was a common thing for some of the converts to Christianity to travel with their teachers in a sort of apprenticeship. This way, men had a practical teaching on evangelism, how to spend the gospel. Paul, from this point on, is looked on as the leader of the missionary party, and is from here, na here on named first, with two significant exceptions. <coughs> Missionaries today are often classed as really the new cultural imperialists. This means a cultural group develops its local story or account of the world. Then they go around imposing their story on other groups of people, crushing others' local stories in the process. The biblical meta narrative God reveals the true story of the world because it comes from the Creator of all. God's story is before every other man's story. Therefore, whoever learns of it first is obligated to tell all of it. Pamphylia was one of the provinces of Asia Minor, the land we now call Turkey. It was north of Cyprus, about 100 miles, and had Cilicia on its eastern border. 
Mycenae on its western and Pisidia on the north, with the waters of the Mediterranean forming its southern border. Perga was the capital city of the province. province. It was located not on the sea coast, but about seven miles inland on the banks of the river Cestus. There was on a mountain near the city a celebrated temple of Diana. There are extensive Greek and Roman ruins of Perga. <clears throat> it is plain from Acts 15, 37 to 39 that Mark's reason for returning to Jerusalem was something that Paul deemed unworthy enough, so that Paul was unwilling to have him as a companion on another journey. We can only guess his motives. Some suggest he was unhappy now that Barnabas is no longer leader of the missionary party, but rather Paul is. Others suggest he was afraid of the robbers who were likely to meet in the mountains. Ramsey suggests that Paul was <coughs> Paul contracted malaria in the lowlands of Pamphylia and decided to go into the higher altitudes to try and shake it off. And when the missionary journey now turned out to be longer than fast anticipated, John heads back to Jerusalem. So, uh, please feel free to come back and continue our missionary journey uh, as it um, proclaims the word of God uh, in these early days.